The incredible story of Apple. The story of how a hippie who took drugs and dropped out of school, turning in bottles and eating for free at a Krishna temple, created the most successful company of our time. How from a small garage grew into the world's number one capital company, creating not just a brand or a quality mark, but a true cult. It all began in the 70s in California. Young Steve Jobs, the future founder of Apple, was looking for enlightenment and the meaning of life. He dropped out of the prestigious Reed College, became a vegetarian, did a lot of meditation, and took drugs. After he dropped out, Jobs had to sleep on his friend's dormitory floor and, to get by, he collected Coca-Cola bottles and went to the Krishna temple on Sundays for free lunches. Jobs had a best friend, Steve Wozniak, also known as Woz, whom he met when he was in high school. Wozniak had already graduated but was a genius in electronics and a real legend of the school. He was five years older than Jobs, but that didn't stop them from becoming friends. Wozniak said. We told each other about our shenanigans and the devices we developed. I felt we had a lot in common. I usually have a hard time explaining to people all the intricacies of the electrical devices I was building, but Steve grasped everything on the fly. I liked him immediately. In 1975, Wozniak attended the first meeting of a group of enthusiasts who called themselves the Homebrew Computer Club. And he immediately set out with great zeal to designing the machine that later became known as Apple One. He worked hard, and by the end of June, he had the first result unique at the time, the display of characters typed on the keyboard. Woz immediately showed his invention to Jobs, who was impressed with it. Jobs soon started talking about the commercial potential of Wozniak's invention. First of all, he persuaded Woz to stop handing out blueprints of the computer to anyone who wanted one. Jobs also pointed out that the club members were actively working on the blueprints, but as a rule, the projects did not get to working models because of the lack of time and skills of their authors. Steve suggested that Woz sell printed circuit boards in the club, which means that he would take on the most difficult part of the work, and the buyer would have to solder the chips to the board according to the ready-made drawings. Jobs estimated that it would cost $20 to produce one board, but he intended to sell it for twice as much. Wozniak was initially skeptical of the idea, the business required at least $1,000 in startup investments that could be recouped after selling 50 units of merchandise. Although the club already had about 500 members, many of them were supporters of fancy off-the-shelf solutions like the Altair 8800, and Woz didn't see enough customers. But Jobs knew his friend too well. He didn't convince Wozniak that the company was sure to be profitable, but painted their venture as an exciting adventure. And it worked. Wozniak said. I thought it would be great. Two best friends starting their own company. Cool. I realized I really wanted it. How could I say no? To raise the necessary amount of money, Jobs had to sell his hippie Volkswagen T1 minivan and switch to a bicycle, while Wozniak sold off one of his main treasures, an HP 65 programmable calculator. From the proceeds, Jobs paid an Atari employee he knew to create a circuit board, which could then be put into mass production. In January 1976, the first batch of boards arrived at the companion's disposal. Jobs needed a third voice in case he disagreed with Wozniak, so Steve took on another Atari engineer, his friend Ron Wayne, who had a bad experience with his own casino slot machine business and therefore had a good grasp of the law and paperwork. Jobs also hoped, with Wayne's help, to convince Wozniak to give up designing calculators for Hewlett Packard and concentrate entirely on his business. All that remained was to register the company, and then he could start selling the product. But first, they had to decide on a name for the company. Jobs had just returned from the Oregon Freedlands All One Farm. That farm was a real hippie commune. Steve pruned apple trees there and even went on an apple diet, becoming a fruitarian and deciding that he was now clean and that washing no more than once a week was enough for him. He returned to Los Altos absolutely happy. Was met him at the airport and drove him in his car into town. On the way, they were choosing a name for the future company, since they had to apply for registration the next morning. Jobs suggested Apple Computer. 
Jobs said, the name sounded fun, energetic, and not scary. The word Apple softened the serious computer. Besides, in the phone book, we would have ended up in front of Atari. Jobs added that if nothing better was proposed by morning, the Apple name would remain. And so it did. So the computer designed by Wozniak was called Apple One. The company was incorporated on April 1, 1976. Wayne drew up the tripartite partnership agreement, he also wrote the first manual for Apple One and created the first Apple logo. However, after 12 days, Wayne, in his own words, realized that he cannot cope with the pace set by the partners, and left the company, taking his share, $800, and then received another $1,500 for a written waiver of any claims. Jobs and Wozniak gave a presentation at another homebrew computer club meeting. Steve Jobs, who was a natural-born orator, spoke passionately and persuasively, addressing rhetorical questions to the audience. However, only one person showed interest in buying Apple One, Paul Terrell, owner of Byte, a computer store recently opened in Menlo Park. The next day Jobs showed up at his store barefoot, and made a deal that he and Wozniak later called the most important one of their lives. Terrell ordered 50 at once, but he wasn't interested in circuit boards, he wanted computers that came with a complete set, and he was paying $500 for each. Jobs immediately agreed, even though they didn't have the funds to fulfill such an order. Jobs also found a way out, he was able to borrow $5,000 from his friends, and borrowed the necessary components from the Kramer Electronics distributor for 30 days, with Paul Terrell as a guarantor, he actually financed the whole project. All his friends were brought in to assemble the order. The associates occupied Jobs' house and garage. The work began. A month later the order was ready, 50 computers were delivered to Terrell by the companions and paid off the loan for the components. The Apple I did not come with keyboards, monitors, or power supplies, not even a case, only a complete motherboard. Despite this, the Apple I is widely regarded as the first computer ever to be supplied by a manufacturer ready-made, because other computers of the time, including the Altair, came to market as kits, which the retailer or the end customer had to assemble. Production of the boards was much less expensive than expected because Jobs was able to negotiate a substantial discount on the components with the supplier. The savings were used to assemble another 50 devices, which Jobs and Wozniak sold to acquaintances from the Homebrew Computer Club, making a profit. Later the companions managed to sell more than a hundred more Apple One computers to other stores and acquaintances. The acquaintance was employed as the company's accountant, and Clara, Jobs' mother, answered the phone as a secretary. Customers and business partners who had never been to Jobs' house had the impression that this address was indeed the location of a solid firm with a large staff. Jobs realized that in order to reach a new level, the product must be sold not only assembled but also fully equipped so that it was not necessary to separately purchase a monitor, keyboard, case, and power supply so that the buyers are not only hackers who build computers themselves, but thousands of ordinary people. Another crucial conclusion Jobs soon reached was that the design of the device made a huge difference. In August Jobs and Wozniak attended the first personal computer festival PC-76 in Atlantic City, where they demonstrated the Apple One. Jobs noted that for all the undeniable functional advantages of their project, it was losing out in presentability to the competition. Back then, computers looked like bulky gray metal boxes that hummed like a tractor. So Jobs designed his own case of white plastic with streamlined edges to make it stand out from the dreary competitors. Engineers designed an innovative power supply that could run without a rattling fan. Wozniak came up with an ingenious way to display a color image on the screen. But all these clever innovations required considerable investment in production. Jobs went to different companies but was refused everywhere, we don't need you, you haven't even graduated from college. Jobs' appearance was shocking, a hippie in sandals who smelled bad had horrible hair and an arrogance that made his ears droop. But Jobs didn't give up and once got to the guru of Silicon Valley startup investing, Don Valentine, who was used to ignoring such things in business. He told Jobs that he was willing to help them, provided Jobs hired someone competent in marketing and distribution and who could draw up a business plan. Such a person turned out to be Mike Markula, chosen by Jobs out of three candidates sent by Valentine. 
A former engineer and marketing manager for Intel products, Markula had made millions from stock options by the time he was 33. He offered jobs and Wozniak financing of up to $250,000 in exchange for a third of Apple's stock. On January 3, 1977, the Apple Computer Partnership was transformed into Apple Corporation. Jobs, Wozniak and Markula each received 26% of the shares, and it was decided to leave the rest to other investors. Wozniak had to leave Hewlett Packard with a heavy heart. After the founding of the corporation, Apple finally got its own office on Stevens Creek Boulevard in Cupertino, and the Jobs family could breathe a sigh of relief. The company already had about a dozen employees. The question of the president of the corporation came up. The 22-year-old rebel Jobs, despite his obvious talents, ambition, and inflamed ego, was definitely not suited for the job, and after much persuasion, he had to admit it. In February 1977, Markula invited Mike Scott from National Semiconductor to take over as CEO. Scott had one job, to tame Jobs. It was really necessary, Steve, feeling out of place at the company because of his loss of sole leadership, was becoming more and more rude, irascible, and oppressive by the day. Whereas he did not dare to sabotage Wozniak or Markula, the ordinary programmers under Woz had a hard time. Scott and Jobs argued frequently. From time to time both had to concede in their disputes, the company's president and its charismatic leader. Nevertheless, Apple evolved. The company brought in Regis McKenna, the chief advertising executive of Silicon Valley. In 1977, the team designed a new logo that didn't change until 1998. In April of that year, Apple achieved a great result at the West Coast Computer Fair. The company received an order for 300 computers already at the fair, and it also had its first foreign dealer, textile magnate Satoshi Mitsushima of Japan. The business was booming, and the company was thriving. And on December 12, 1980, Apple went public. The stock was listed at $22. In just one hour, 4.6 million shares were floated. Apple became the most successful company in the history of the stock exchange. At the age of 25, Jobs became fabulously rich, with a fortune of $256 million. There was little competition, and thanks to the Apple II model, sales skyrocketed from 2,500 in 1977 to 210,000 in 1981. But this wasn't enough for Jobs, he wanted to leave his mark on the universe. He hoped the Apple III would make that mark. This particular model was the first attempt to design and produce a computer whose development was driven by marketing concerns from the start. Jobs rudely interfered with the project every time. His abnormal craving for perfection forced him to make the case almost microscopic, so the board turned out with an excessive density of components and bad connectors that often failed. So the Apple III failed miserably. Over time, the machine was improved, making it more stable, but the Apple III's reputation was already hopelessly ruined. In 1983, IBM PCs were the biggest seller, leaving Apple products behind, and two years later the Apple III was phased out completely. Jobs went on to launch a project called Lisa, in honor of his newly born daughter, whom, at the same time, he did not want to acknowledge. Similarly, he did not recognize the connection between her name and the name of the computer. Apple engineers did the job of designing a better and more powerful computer than the Apple II, but a completely mediocre one that was essentially nothing new. At the time, the whole of America was obsessed with VHS VCRs like crazy, almost every family was eager to buy them, and computers were seen as something super incomprehensible. Computers used DOS queries that would make the hell out of it. So it had to be the eighth wonder of the world for computers to become as popular as VCRs. But the Xerox PARC Research Center was already working on such a miracle, a super simple computer that even a drunken novice could figure out what was what. Instead of DOS queries, they came up with the idea of using graphics, a desktop with documents and folders that magically opened at the click of a mouse. At the time this seemed like magic. This project was highly classified. But in 1979, Xerox was eager to invest in Apple. And Jobs agreed on the condition that they reveal all their secrets. 
Xerox decided that these upstarts didn't have enough intelligence to understand their super genius invention and agreed. When Jobs came to Xerox to familiarize himself with the new miracle technology, Xerox decided to trick him and showed him not everything. Jobs demanded more. But every time he was shown something different, some other frivolous programs to divert his eyes from the main secret. Jobs realized this, realized he was being fooled, and said so. He called the head of venture capital at Xerox and complained, and when Jobs' team finally saw the invention in full, they were amazed. Engineer Bill Atkinson stared intently into every pixel, almost climbing into the screen with his head. Jobs galloped around the computer, waving his hands excitedly. He repeated that he couldn't understand why Xerox hadn't put this technology into mass production. Steve exclaimed. It's a gold mine. I can't believe Xerox hasn't taken advantage of it yet. At the Smalltalk presentation, Jobs and his colleagues were shown three amazing things. The first was how computers can communicate over a network. The second was how object-oriented programming works. But all of this went largely unnoticed. What struck Jobs' team the most was the graphical interface and the bitmap screen. It was as if a veil had fallen from my eyes, Steve later admitted. I realized what the future of computers should be. Xerox received the promised 100,000 shares of Apple stock. The price of those shares was a million, but from the outside, it looked like the most audacious heist in the history of the computer industry. But one idea is not enough, the main thing is implementation. And Jobs did it beautifully. They made the mouse sleeker and more comfortable. They made the casing as simple as a toaster. They significantly reduced the size of the keyboard by shoving the system unit under the screen. They improved the interface and made commands smoother. The computer was called a Macintosh. While all this was going on, in August 1981 IBM released its computer. Jobs believed that if he lost this battle, the computer industry would plunge for 20 years into the dark middle ages. He liked to think of himself as a rebel against the evil empire and IBM was well suited to that role. Jobs believed that fate had given him the greatest mission to save the planet. But to save the planet, the company needed a good president who had weighed on Wall Street. In 1983 Jobs understood that he was not yet ripe for such a position because he got overexcited at the slightest provocation. So the board of directors hooked up with the chief advertising wizard of the time, John Scully of PepsiCo, but he flatly refused. Jobs wooed him for a long time and after a few months poached him, saying the killer line that went down in history, will you spend the rest of your life selling sugar water, or will you finally decide to do something really important? Apple's new miracle operating system worked only on native hardware. Jobs thought the complete incompatibility with other computers was a genius solution. At that time, however, the then-unknown Bill Gates was writing software for Apple. He saw this wonderful interface with stunning graphics on Mac, quickly realized that this wonder is the future, and in 1983, at a lavish conference, he triumphantly announced that Microsoft was developing a Windows with a GUI just like Apple. On learning of this, Jobs was furious, accusing Gates of shameless theft. But Gates gave a witty reply that also went down in history, I snuck over to our mutual neighbor Xerox to steal a TV set and found that you beat me to it. Meanwhile, the evil empire was ahead of Apple. IBM sold three times as many computers, and its market share was up 26%. So all hope was in the Macintosh. In planning its launch, Jobs wanted people to be numb with amazement. And in 1984, the Apple team, along with filmmaker Ridley Scott, shot a video showing Apple as God's chosen messiah rising up against the forces of darkness. In the video, it was shown how in the grey world of propaganda, the main character in bright clothes represents Macintosh and her rebellious actions symbolize the revolution. The video, in the spirit of science fiction, alluded to the total domination of IBM and George Orwell's prophecy. IBM represented an evil empire and Apple was an alliance of rebels that liberates people from oblivion. The $750,000 video, however, only made the board of directors want to vomit. They thought it was the worst commercial they had ever seen. But there was no turning back, the airtime had already been bought, during the Super Bowl soccer game, a time when half the population of the United States gathers at the screens. 
Every second of airtime was worth its weight in gold. 30 seconds was worth $5.2 million, a huge fortune at the time. As a result, the entire country watched as a grim image of a marching crowd appeared to ominous music. The daring, disturbing, and mysterious video, unlike any other, was seen by 96 million viewers. All the TV stations raged that night, talking about it alone. The commercial had a bombshell effect because, at the time, most young people saw computers as tools of power that turned people into a herd of submissive robots, and the commercial captured the spirit of the revolution. The commercial hinted that Apple opposed the sinister plan of big corporations to enslave the world and the minds of people. It also resonated well with Americans because, at the time, the Cold War was in full swing with the totalitarian Soviet regime, which President Reagan then called the evil empire. For the first hundred days, the Macintosh was flying off the shelves at a breakneck pace, but when the wave of enthusiasm subsided, it turned out that all was not so good. The Mac was terribly slow. No advertising helped. You had to pay for a pretty picture, you needed more power. The Macintosh had too little memory. There was no built-in hard drive. The lack of a fan caused frequent crashes. When customers realized all this, sales plummeted. Jobs believed that everything he touched turned to gold, so he didn't test it. The Mac lacked software, had no expansion slots, and had a small screen. The computer would spit out a floppy disk at the slightest thing and demand something from the user. Whereas IBM supported a thousand programs. Because of the endless tweaks Jobs made, the price of the Macintosh rose to $1,995. Jobs saw a horrifying picture, the first thing store clerks showed customers was IBM and those who wanted a Mac were reoriented to IBM anyway. Therefore, sales were steadily declining. Jobs was burdened by this situation. The engineers became depressed. For months they could do nothing. Many talented people left the company. But the big news was the departure of veteran Wozniak. He considered it the height of folly to underestimate the Apple II, which was still the company's main source of income. The warehouses were overflowing with a huge stock of unsold computers. Apple was in a panic and was sinking like the Titanic. Jobs himself was largely to blame, he made a computer for organizations and advertised it to ordinary people. If Jobs had taken his time, the picture might have been different, but it always seemed to him that he had a short life to live and so he had to hurry to get things done. Jobs was supposed to control Scully, but Jobs charmed Scully so much that he lost his head and thought he was special and the more Jobs manipulated him, the more he despised him. Disagreement increasingly disturbed the board of directors. Jobs' mood swings became more and more violent. He could humiliate and smear anyone he met in the corridor. His subordinates saw the company as a rudderless boat headed for the fog. And eventually, Scully dismissed Jobs from the Macintosh project. Jobs decided not to give up so easily, and planned, in Scully's absence, to stage a coup in the board of directors and seize power. Even Jobs' most loyal supporters thought the plan was insane and tried to dissuade him. Scully found out about everything, cancelled his trip, and on May 24, 1985, at a meeting of the board of directors, he denounced Jobs' plans. The board sided with Scully and fired Jobs as head of the Macintosh division. Steve felt betrayed and abandoned by everyone. He was given a small house, away from Apple's main buildings, Jobs called it, Siberia. After a while, he just stopped going to work and made sure no one noticed his absence. So Jobs lasted five months in the formal position of chairman of the board, with no real authority, after which he left Apple. Many employees, however, were unhappy with Jobs' dismissal the company was no longer good for creativity and they left with Jobs. The board members, upon learning of this departure, reacted extremely harshly, many were furious. They thought Jobs had fooled them. The members were stunned by the treacherous act of Jobs, who had secretly plotted to take their most valuable employees right out from under their noses. All of these traders were unceremoniously ejected from the company and Jobs was sued. Afterward, Apple's stock rose 7%, as shareholders were happy that the Californian slacker was no longer in charge. Steve was depressed but not destroyed, he wasn't going to give up and go into the shadows. 
Once hanging around universities, Jobs met with biochemist Paul Berg, a Nobel laureate, who was depressed and indignant about the fact that without a powerful computer for only one single experiment they spent as much as a week. Hearing this, Jobs was inspired by the idea of making powerful computers for universities and founded a new company called Next. Jobs wanted to make a computer in the shape of a perfect black cube. The cube represented solidity. Imitating the Japanese, Jobs built an expensive robot factory, so the money went very quickly. In September 1986, to find more money, Jobs put some stock up for sale for $3 million, an amount he took out of nowhere. The company had no accomplishments, no products, and no revenues up to that point. So no investor was in a hurry to invest. And yet Jobs attracted the attention of one, a Texan named Ross Perot, who took to Jobs' ideas, called and said, if you need money, just whistle. Perot's biggest regret in life was not investing in Microsoft when Bill Gates, as a young kid, begged him for money. This time Ross Perot was determined not to repeat his mistakes and invested $20 million for a 16% stake. In addition to the money, Perot brought next solidity in the eyes of others. Wherever he went, he praised Jobs to one and all. In October 1988 Jobs made a brilliant presentation of the next, which caused a storm of excitement. Business was good for a while. But over time, interest in the company waned. There were few compatible programs for Next, and there were cheaper analogs on the market. The expensive factory was idle. Jobs was maligned as a one-time miracle, because other than the Apple II model he had nothing but failures. Design alone was not enough to make a computer sell well. By the mid-1990s, Next, with 240 employees, was supplying cutting-edge software to major customers such as Dell, the Walt Disney Company, WorldCom, and the BBC, but it still wasn't growing much. Jobs realized that he could not make it on his own, and once again began to look to Apple, which was not doing so brilliantly. Apple was run by Michael Spindler from 1993 to 1996, and then by Gil Emilio from 1996 to 1997. Between 1994 and 1996, the company introduced three consecutive QuickTake 100, 150, and 200 color cameras with a 640x480 sensor and 24-bit color. These were some of the first digital cameras of the modern type, but there was no further development of these products by Apple. After Jobs left, Apple held on to the old ideas and developments for a few years, and then its market share dropped from 16% to 4%. Microsoft at this time reaped the benefits of successfully copying ideas, in 1995 Windows became the most successful OS, while the Macintosh was on the verge of disaster. Watching Microsoft rapidly devouring market share and wiping Windows computers off the shelves, Apple executives deviated from the Jobs principle and allowed to sell Macintosh OS licenses to other manufacturers, but this made the situation even worse, computer sales plummeted even more. Management believed that the only way to save themselves was to sell the company. But no one wanted to buy a lame horse with one foot in the grave. Jobs could have taken over Apple and become the head of his brainchild again. But he didn't want a forced takeover, he wanted them to call him in. They wanted to get their hands on his operating system. That was the plan to enslave Jobs, Apple buys his company next, which gives him the right to join the Apple board of directors, and from there it was a stone's throw from the CEO position. And Apple fell for it, in 1996 they bought Next for $426 million. The situation at Apple changed with the return of jobs. Apple began to gradually open up new markets, not directly related to computer technology. At first, in 1997, Jobs did not interfere in the company and was at Apple as an unofficial consultant. But gradually he began to move his people into key positions. At some point, amid low sales and a disastrous situation in the company, Jobs was finally invited to take over as CEO. But Jobs did not accept right away. In 1997, staff turnover was abundant, in order to stop it, Jobs decided to finally intervene in the management and review the price of options of employees, but the directors opposed it. Then Jobs said he would leave the company and never return because he had no time to please the board of directors, and demanded that everyone resign. Only Woolard could stay. Given the situation, many wanted to leave themselves. Even Markula found himself out of a job. 
Eventually, Jobs took over as CEO. By this time Jobs had gained wisdom and matured. The company at that point was making many variations of each product model. It was pure madness, tons of completely unnecessary products. Even the employees themselves no longer knew what they were doing. Jobs cut back on the product line by 70%. Jobs' ability to concentrate saved Apple. In the first year, he laid off more than 3,000 employees. After two years of staggering losses, with bankruptcy just around the corner, Apple finally squeezed out a profit. The news of Jobs return to the helm lifted Apple stock from $13 to $20. At the Macworld conference in Boston in August 1997, loyal Apple fans greeted Jobs like a rock star. At the speech, Jobs unexpectedly announced a partnership with Microsoft, which would invest $150 million in Apple. The bitter enemies suddenly united. By then, Microsoft was already the king of the mountain in the market, so Jobs needed his friendship with Gates to buy time and climb out of the bottom. On this news, the stock skyrocketed, adding $830 million to the company's value in just one day. Apple was one foot in the grave and suddenly came back to life. In the computer industry, all the manufacturers created the same gray boxes, outsourcing production and competing only on price. Jobs decided that a revolutionary device should look appropriate. In most companies, the designers adapt to the manufacturers, but Jobs did the opposite, first the design, and the engineers already adapt to the case. So in 98, there was the crazy and futuristic iMac with the transparent turquoise plastic body that looked like a giant blob. At the time, this computer looked like it had been teleported from the future. Instead of pale blocks, individual monitors, and a pile of wires, it was an exquisitely elegant device. In those days, people were afraid and shunned technology. But iMac owners put it in the most prominent place in their homes to make their guests jealous. Like wildlings, people swept the computers off the shelves. By the end of the year, they had sold 800,000 units. Bill Gates assured everyone around him that this success was only temporary. Jobs was outraged that his super innovative computers were on the shelves with disgusting consumer products like Dell, and the salespeople didn't even bother to explain the difference. And the stores were in the middle of nowhere. So Jobs decided to build his own stores. He designed every tiny detail of the minimalist interior himself. Analysts amicably predicted failure. The board of directors wasn't thrilled with Jobs' crazy new idea either. Many firms went bankrupt when they opened their own chain. It seemed insane. But by 2004, more than 5,000 people a week were visiting Apple stores, and profits reached $1.2 billion, an all-time record for retail. When a new outlet opened, visitors slept at the door to be the first to get in. But the shopping problem paled in comparison to the ominous darkness that loomed over the digital world in 2001. In the 90s the word internet was like a magic spell, and all investors were flipping out and investing in dot-coms. But the dot-com bubble burst and the Nasdaq index immediately plummeted by almost 50%. Everyone said the fairy tale of the computer age was over. But Jobs thought it was for their own good. And while competitors tightened their belts, Apple kept inventing and turning the computer into a digital hub, the heart for all other gadgets that controlled and synchronized. Now it was easy to plug in the camera and upload the video to disk, and thanks to the program iMovie even a pensioner could easily edit a cool blockbuster with special effects and music. However, when synchronizing with music, Apple was in for a headache. In 2000, everyone began to copy music to their computers and burn their own compilations onto disks. About 320 million blank CDs were sold in the US that year. But at the time, all the programs were extremely awkward and complicated. In 2001, Jobs created iTunes, a program for burning disks. But this wasn't enough, it needed to be able to connect well with music players. But at the time, all players were not yet advanced enough. They were impossible to use, and they only held a measly 16 songs. And because Jobs loved listening to music, he decided to make his own player. The player was built in just one year. This unrealistically fast time was achieved because Jobs was in a very tight rush. 
He believed that if you want a super team, you have to be ruthless. The weak attracted the weak. Jobs' toughness did him good. Dozens of aggrieved employees ended their sob stories by admitting that Jobs got them what they could not even dream of. Jobs knew how to brainwash and infect his team with the drive and confidence that they could do the impossible. And people did the impossible. So in 2001 came the iPod with a built-in hard drive the size of a coin, which held a thousand songs and worked without a charge for 10 hours. Any track could be reached with just three taps. Next to the iPod, all the other players looked just awful. But the public was skeptical of the iPod with its exorbitant price of $399 in 2001. The internet joked that the name iPod stood for, idiots demanded a lot of money. Soon, however, sales skyrocketed. You could see a man with white headphones on every block. Following that, good iPod sales spurred sales of iMac computers. So Jobs let even more money go to iPod advertising, an astronomical 75 million. That's a hundred times more than the competition was spending. And in doing so, he crushed the entire market. But in 2002, Apple faced a new problem in the music industry. To play music on the iPod, it was necessary to download it from the internet, and the internet was flooded with pirate services. Piracy in those days drove everyone crazy. It was the Wild West all around. The record companies were frantically looking for a way to protect themselves. And it wasn't only them who suffered, people downloading free music were confronted with viruses and terrible quality. Jobs realized that the best way to fight the theft was to create an alternative. Because 80% of the people stealing music had no choice. So Jobs created an online music store, the iTunes Store, and convinced the major record companies to allow music to be sold there. And not whole albums, but one song at a time, each for 99 cents. Because usually there are only two or three good tracks on an album, and the rest is just dreary crap. Many musicians' contracts forbade selling music individually. So Jobs had to personally persuade some artists. When Jobs showed Dr. Dre the iPod and iTunes store interaction, he exclaimed, man, at least somebody finally did it. The store had 200,000 songs when it opened in 2003. It sold as many as a million pieces in the first six days. But a lot of people couldn't use the iTunes store because the store didn't work on Windows. No one thought that day would ever come, but in 2003 Apple made a version of iTunes for its nemesis, Windows. Journalists asked Jobs what it was like to be a program developer for Windows. Jobs replied, it's like handing a glass of ice water to someone in hell. By 2004, Apple had dominated the player market. Whereas previously you had to pay an astronomical sum of money to get a celebrity to advertise, now musicians themselves wanted to appear in iPod commercials. Because it guaranteed them a resounding success. For example, Bob Dylan, who had already forgotten, promoted his iPod in his music video, and it reached number one on the Billboard chart in the very first week. iTunes could literally catapult anyone onto a pedestal of fame. iPod sales were astounding. In 2004, it sold 5 million. In 2005, 20 million. But suddenly phones with a built-in player began to appear all over the world. This meant only one thing the iPod would soon be dead. Video cameras were already starting to sell worse because of it. Jobs realized that if they didn't make a phone, they would be left at the empty trough. He noticed one odd thing, at the time all the phones on the market were very ugly, and their designs were hideous. And by the time you figured them out, your brain would explode. All this pervasive stupidity inspired him to create a truly user-friendly phone. Plus, at the time, the phone market was growing by leaps and bounds. Jobs realized that if he could create a super product, it would be as smashing a success as the iPod. In 2004, Apple employees began to notice their colleagues mysteriously disappearing from the office and never showing up again. No one could explain where they were going. So Jobs was recruiting people for a secret lab to create an epic device. The engineers considered themselves elite and hardly ever left the lab, they ate, showered, slept in, celebrated holidays, and worked in one place. 
At the time, touchscreens were already available, but they all worked with a stylus. Jobs believed that if you offered a stylus, you were dead, so his elite engineers created a touchscreen without a stylus. As a result, you could move a picture on the screen with the flick of a finger. It seemed like magic at the time. Keypad buttons took up a lot of screen space, so elite engineers made the buttons virtual, appearing only when they were needed. As a result, the screen took up all the space up to the edges, the case had only a thin bezel around the edges. The result was the iPhone, which combined three devices, a player, a computer, and a phone. When the iPhone went on sale in 2007, competitors thought it was too expensive for its $500 price tag. Business people wouldn't use a phone without a keyboard, they thought. But by the end of 2010, Apple had sold 90 million iPhones, the company had snatched more than half of the global cell phone market's profits. Fans called the iPhone the Jesus phone. Now, thanks to this versatile device, Apple's budget is larger even than that of the US Treasury Department. And in 2010 the iPad tablet computer was launched on the market, which also became a very successful product. The production of the iPod, iPhone, and iPad, which were in high demand around the world, dramatically improved Apple's financial situation, bringing the company record profits. In August 2011, Apple became the world's most valuable company by market capitalization, surpassing ExxonMobil, the oil company. An unprecedented success. But Jobs didn't have time to enjoy it. On October 5, 2011, the day after the launch of the iPhone 4S, Steve Jobs died. He was only 56. Unheard of mourning enveloped the entire planet. All the stores turned into temples. When Jobs discovered a pancreatic tumor, he treated it for a long time with folk remedies. So cancer had time to spread to other organs, and doctors were powerless. It's not often you meet a 40-year-old innovator, but Jobs' business took off just as he was turning 40. Jobs proved that even after 40 a man can remain inspired. He always wondered why those who are over 30 begin to think in narrow patterns and stop keeping up with progress. People, like a needle in a broken record, get stuck in those patterns and then can't get free of them at all and go sour. It is extremely rare for a person not to lose interest in life and retain a childlike curiosity until death. Jobs glorified madmen and rebels, all those who think differently, unconventionally. Jobs' marketing somehow led people to believe that they were free, creative, progressive rebels, just because they used Apple. After Steve's death, skeptics predicted the decline of Apple. We saw Apple with Jobs. We've seen Apple without Jobs, said billionaire Larry Ellison, recalling that after Jobs first left Apple in 1985, the company's business went downhill. Apple has passed its peak, only a decline from here, former engineer Dan Crow wrote in The Guardian. Forbes columnist Peter Cohen insisted year after year that Apple was doomed. Since then, however, Apple's capitalization has grown incredibly, from $348 billion to $2.4 trillion. Apple became the first American company and the second in the world to surpass the $2 trillion mark, and the company increased its second trillion just in three years. Thus, with Tim Cook at the head, Apple has become the flagship of American business. However, the management styles and attitudes towards the products of these two top managers are very different, despite the fact that in August 2011 it was Steve Jobs who strongly recommended Tim's chief operating officer to become the head of Apple. Under Cook, several new, seemingly not revolutionary products were released, including the Apple Watch and AirPods, but they were fantastically successful, it is worth remembering that the watch is not only the market leader in smartwatches, but it is also simply the number one watch in the world. Tim Cook staked on the ecosystem, which under Jobs was still fragmented, thereby tying users to Apple. Conventionally speaking, under him, the company began to make not only new iPhones but everything for the new iPhones, accessories, watches, speakers, headphones, and services. If you like the Apple Watch, get an iPhone. If you like the MacBook, buy an iPhone for easy interaction. That's the philosophy. Jobs was very sensitive about new products, but he was sure that he knew what the customer needed and didn't need to give the consumer a choice. During his presidency, only one iPhone or iPad model was announced. 
At a time when the market was marked by a trend in the growth of displays, the company continued to produce smartphones with 3.5-inch screens, as Jobs thought was enough. That was, for example, the iPhone 4S, announced the day before Steve's death. At the same time, the main competitor, Samsung, a month earlier introduced the first Galaxy Note with a 5.3-inch diagonal. Tim Cook, on the other hand, is adjusting to the market to please the maximum number of consumers. Under him, there is the large and very popular iPhone 6 Plus, and in recent years we are presented with a whole line of devices for every palm and taste. Wall Street longed for Apple to finally start making money, but Jobs preferred to reinvest all profits in new products. Cook, on the contrary, allowed an army of investors to make money by buying back the company's stock. Over eight years, Apple gave $360.7 billion to investors this way. In the end, even Warren Buffett, who despised technology companies, believed in the company. Cook forced Apple to become a socially responsible company. One of his first steps as CEO was to introduce a corporate program of charitable donations, for example, to the Anti-Defamation League, which opposes anti-Semitism. In 2014, Cook met with top Apple executives to personally inform them that he was gay. Cook planned a coming out, despite concerns that it might backfire on the company in some markets. According to the Wall Street Journal, Tim Cook has become something of a conscience for Apple, including on this issue, he explained that he wanted to be an example for homosexual young people, many of whom still suffer from social oppression or misunderstanding from relatives. I needed to do something for them and show that you can be gay and still go on to do great things in life," he explained himself. The relocation of production to the PRC took place under Jobs, but it was Tim Cook who became the architect of Apple's Chinese strategy, which bet on giant factories where labor was many times cheaper than American, and productivity was higher. Later, he had to show a diplomatic flair to keep that from collapsing. First, Cook withstood the pressure of two administrations and was able to build a good relationship even with Trump, who declared a trade war on Beijing and scolded corporations for refusing to return production chains to America. Second, a New York Times investigation found that the company removes apps from China's app store that mention taboo topics such as the Dalai Lama, the shooting of demonstrators at Tiananmen Square, and the independence movements in Tibet and Taiwan. It turned out that Apple also transferred local users' data to government servers in China and began providing Chinese authorities with access to it. All this in order to keep production and not lose the big Chinese market. Given the geopolitical situation in the world, which has heated up in 2022, Apple could be in trouble. But however it goes on, for now, Apple is both the most expensive company by capitalization and the most popular brand, in everything in the world. The rebellious genius of Jobs, the technical genius of Wozniak, the managerial genius of Cook, and many other talented people are the ingredients that have created the brand number one in the world. And, of course, uncompromising competition with a strong opponent in the form of Bill Gates and his company Microsoft, which will be discussed in our next video. So subscribe and click the bell so you don't miss the next video. Fight free!